Spoilers for X-Men 97. If you've not watched episode five, remember it, then you need to not listen to this. You've been warned. Spoilers. Okay, hey everybody, it's Poe here. Man, I got I gotta process that. Wow. So, you know, let's just acknowledge the obvious. X-Men 97 has been incredible, and it's wonderful to see how they've brought in a lot of aspects of the comics that have occurred over the last several decades into the series in such a short amount of time. On the one hand, as I've said before, I feel like a lot of these stories need a little bit more air. For example, kind of seeing Genosha as an established country recognized by the UN, yada, yada, yada. Would have been cool to see it exist in like a few more episodes. But at the same time, they were so effective at communicating so much about this place in such a short amount of time that the impact of the terrorist attack was whew, so much, so much about this episode. Like, it's a bold story to tell in the modern context. I'd, that's the extent of it, I'll say. I'll just say it's a very bold story to tell in the modern context. But that's X-Men. X-Men has always leaned into current events and the zeitgeist and not exactly in not controversial ways. The entirety of the Technovirus, what uh, Nate, aka Cable, was born with, if I'm not mistaken, was created as an analog for the AIDS pandemic and how that impacted marginalized groups more so than others. So the same thing with mutants here in the X-Men. Anyway, you get my point, right? Like this is textbook X-Men. So there's that. There's the rogue Magneto thing, which I'm probably going to do an entire separate video on. But the main reason I wanted to kind of get on here and just process kind of out loud for a second is because like Gambit was like my hero growing up. Growing up, I was super into Spider-Man and the X-Men because of the cartoons. Like those were to me much higher tier than Batman, the animated series. And I, I get that that's blasphemy for some people. So I apologize, but I'm just, I'm just telling you me, right? Like for me, the Spider-Man and the X-Men cartoons were like my superhero cartoons and really my introduction into superhero -dom. And while there were aspects of who Spider-Man was as a person that connected with me, being kind of this young geek, can't quite get it all together as he's trying to figure out everything, there was a cultural representation, even in a flawed, over-the-top, campy way, that we saw in the characters of Rogue and Gambit for someone born in the South that you didn't really see in popular culture. Like typically whenever somebody is introduced into a movie or a television show, if they have a Southern accent, that's supposed to be code for the audience to assume they're the bad guy. Like, oh, this person is backwards, stupid, racist, whatever it may be. As if those traits don't exist regardless of where you are and regardless of your accent. And so to have these two characters of Rogue and Gambit, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional actually, be Southern representation in superherodom was fantastic and completely against the common narrative that still persists about the Southern character archetype in pop culture. Like I remember very specifically in the X-Men films when Rogue, they, they kind of retconned her backstory and kind of gave her more of a specific physical city of origin, which was Meridian, Mississippi. That's where I grew up. I grew up in Meridian, Mississippi. <laughs> and like that, that hit, like I stood up in the movie theater and cheered when that happened. And I get that like part of the reason they probably plucked that city out is because there's a sense of, you know, from Nowheresville, Mississippi, but we're from Nowheresville, Mississippi. A lot of us are from Nowheresville, wherever, you know what I mean? But then there's Gambit. And while I spent most of my childhood in Meridian, Mississippi, my family is largely from Louisiana. New Orleans holds a very special place to me, Baton Rouge as well. And so much of the food and culture, and especially like, I just always associate the best memories and the best times of my life with Louisiana and with my family there. And then on top of that, like his name is Remy LeBeau. So, you know, obviously I introduced myself on the most of the videos. My name is Bo. It's not spelled B-O. It's spelled B-E-A-U <laughs> because of the Cajun influence of my name. And I remember growing up, most kids couldn't spell my name. Like everybody would always call me B-A-U or B-O or they'd make fun of the way it was spelled or they just would write B-O until I had to correct them. As the, as the cards started popping up, like as the X-Men trading cards started popping up and people could see Remy LeBeau, like right there on his, on his trading card, it, like it connected with people and suddenly it wasn't something that people kept on getting wrong. It was really kind of a cool factor. It's like, oh, like Gambit. Oh, your name's spelled like Gambit. It's, it's pretty great.
And so even through this kind of stereotype over the top character that we got in Gambit, which again was very of the time, it was the nineties, everything was over the top. You had 20 gajillion pockets more than you needed. You know, it, it just is what it is. And especially like the X-Men at the time it's like, okay, like there's diversity, but they're like, all of us are like the, <laughs> like all of the different characters are kind of the most extreme caricature of wherever they come from. But look, he was our guy. He was charming. He was flawed. He was a thief, but a hero, the rogue with the heart of gold. And I loved that he didn't just have like a cool power that was like, oh, I touch things and they blow up. And I've got kind of this, you know, poker aesthetic and all that kind of good stuff. No, like his mutation wasn't just a cool power. It was also very visual. You could see it in his eyes that he was a mutant instantly. And yet he was confident in who he was. Now I've given X-Men 97 a hard time for diminishing Gambit a bit, specifically in his ability to create beignets. But my God, what a send off. Okay. So (laughs) I sat down to record and like the first thing I thought of is, man, part of getting older, part of going throughout life, and having these childhood heroes. And I don't know that this has always been the case. I think this is something that's, that's a little bit more modern. In terms of the way that we treat fictional heroes, like, I've had the time to establish love for these heroes as a child, and I've grown up to watch them die. <laughs> like, I was thinking about this. Like, I, you know, I saw, I watched Wolverine die. I watched Charles Xavier die. And I don't mean the one that we don't talk about. I mean, like in, in Logan specifically, I watched Luke Skywalker fade away. And now I'm sitting here watching Gambit get the most epic death scene in like anything I can think of right now. Like it was incredible. And what a great, I mean, like, you know what? It's Iron Man level. It's that same type of moment, right? It's the callback to Iron Man sitting there, standing across from Thanos facing his demise. And his final words are, I am Iron Man. And so here we have Gambit standing here in that heroic role. And this is in a much more, honestly, like real kind of heroic death because he's going to stop this immediate attack, but the problem doesn't magically disappear or go away. Like everything, there's still a ton that has to be reckoned with. And so in the greater scheme of things, this is almost like a little tiny drop, except that drop creates ripples that protects those that still survive to fight the good fight, to live on. And it's such a, an incredible heroic death. And it's all wrapped around this moment as he's stabbed. And you think for a brief moment, okay, well, it's not, that's not a fatal stab. He might get it. And then you realize his power set and the name is Gambit. Remember it. Mm. Now this is X-Men. This is the comics. And if this episode is any indication they're likely bringing in a lot of Krakoa-based storylines in here. So does that mean Gambit may return? Possibly. Probably. I'd be shocked if he doesn't. I'll just say that. But regardless, this episode really impacted me. And I'm sitting here with tears in my eyes, watching Rogue hold Gambit's body and all they ever wanted to do was touch each other. And finally here, holding his lifeless body, She can literally touch him, but she can't feel him anymore. Oh, this was the best episode. This was the best episode of television I've seen in quite some time. My only critique of it is that I wish this could have been more of like a three episode arc as opposed to squashed into one episode, but I can't even be that upset with it because they accomplished so much in so little a time. Oh man. All right. Well, Well, there you go. Those just some quick thoughts. Like I said, this isn't really even a full review. I doubt this will even have the full kind of editing that I normally do for the video just because I want to get this out. I am going to put out another video sooner rather than later talking about kind of the Rogue Gambit Magneto and unpacking the Rogue Con, aka the Retcon, the aka the Rogue 2, Me Too. There's a lot going on there. But anyway, that's coming. But for now, I don't know. I'm going to have to find some fuchsia or something like that to wear (laughs) just in honor because my goodness, the name is Gambit. And we will definitely remember it. What do you think of this episode? I'd love to talk more about it. How did these uh, big, <laughs> how did some of these big swings hit you? Put it in the comments. Let's talk about it.